afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And let me uh, thank, thank my friend Kathy uh, for such a warm uh, introduction and certainly um, very personal, meaningful statement that you made. I like to think, and I try to intentionally do this, uh, surround myself with the people that I want to be like and the people who make me better. Uh, oftentimes, making me better means challenging me. Uh, sometimes it means, hey, girl, you got that. Uh, other times it means, let's think about this together. So I'm really grateful to count her and Monica in uh, those people that uh, I want to be like. And they also, hopefully, uh, will see some reflection of themselves in me. So thank you all very much for that. I, I am just delighted to be here with you all and certainly welcome you to your, your community college. Uh, this is the community's college. How many of you is the first time you've been here to this campus? Wow, I love that. So I think we have to make this something that we uh, host in the future as well so we can have people be at the campus more uh, because we are the community's college and we exist and our mission is exactly the work that we're doing here today and the work that you're doing each and every day. Um, I started my career as an English faculty member. I still do that from time to time and what I know to be sure is that just because it's Saturday, uh, our students are never far from our mind. Uh, so I'm hopeful today that I might say a few things that invite our students in, uh, their spirits here, but also uh, the work that they do and the lives that they lived. They lead each and every day. Uh, I want to lift that up, but I also want to lift up this notion of literacy. And I love the fact that that is boldly articulated in the McHale title and also the work that you do. So when I was asked to speak here today, uh, I, I started spending a lot of time thinking about literacy, and I kept going back to this idea of radical inclusion, something I've been spending a lot of time here at the college talking about over the last couple of years, this idea that as an in college, we're going to be intentional about ensuring that everyone who comes to Montgomery College will hopefully find a space and place for them here, that they will feel comfortable in their own skin when they come to Montgomery College, and that we rise up to meet them in very deliberate ways. I'm hopeful that our students who come here feel feel better because of their experience here, that they come back to class, that they invest more in themselves, and that they feel more connected to their fellow learners and to the people with whom they are being taught by and those that they are in the classrooms being supported with. Because the research tells us very profoundly that this actually leads to more success. Um, it's not just a feel-good initiative, although it may feel good and feel right for most of us to talk about inclusion and the radical nature of that. If you go back to the, the Latin for radical, it actually means to get to the root, right? So if we really want to talk about inclusion, dare I say, as a nation, and I, since I can't speak for the nation right now, I'll speak for Montgomery County, that we should be much more deliberate about getting to the root of inclusion, understanding how we are situated in this work, and what is demanded of us right now at this time. Now, I understand the mission of the Montgomery Coalition for Adult English Literacy, Literacy speaks to this end, a commitment to building, quote, a network to support a thriving community and effective workforce, end quote. These goals rely on individual success, and the classrooms that your students and my students find themselves in tend to be classrooms where we're trying to build community to prepare people to be ready for the 21st century workforce so they can not only survive but thrive in these spaces that they have come to live in. But I want us to take a step back, if you don't mind, and to look at literacy through a historic lens uh, because I think you can't really understand where you are now until you really spend time thinking about where you are and where you have been. Since in the United States, we know that literacy has been used as a political tool since the very beginning of this nation. Uh, slaves were not allowed to write in some parts of the South, and in fact, it was mostly illegal to teach a slave to write in some areas. There were some exceptions for the Bible, uh, but for most everything else, it was considered illegal because that's just how powerful literacy is. If you really think about that, that at the end of the day, if I, I really own the fact of how powerful something is because I deny your basic ability to have it. 
I'm going to let you sit with that for a minute because all y'all know is I guess I'm preaching to the choir on this one because that to me is really what's happened here. The great abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass said himself, quote, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Reading and writing were and still are radical tools because they threaten the hegemony of the power brokers of that community, in that case, slave owners. Even after slavery was abolished, there were vestiges of that control in our voting processes. Not too long ago, we think back to 1965 and other times, there were literacy tests at polling places, a mechanism to prevent African Americans from voting. Literacy, my friends, is power, both symbolically and literally. And in the 21st century, I think that we all can appreciate the practical applications of literacy. You can't get a middle skill job without being literate. Even service jobs in this economy require a baseline level of literacy. Literacy has clear advantages for advancement and wage earning. And that's the problem why so many frequently our recent immigrants enroll in our English classes because they are trying to find their pathway to middle skill jobs and middle skill earnings. More importantly, beyond the workforce, you also have to be literate to navigate modern life, to get a driver's license, to register your child for school. So what do you do in the classes that you do each and every day is fundamentally radically inclusive, it is an act of power that you are imparting to the students who come to your classrooms each and every day. So going back to this notion of literacy as a political tool, I would offer to you that it is even more imperative now today than ever. Groups that can successfully organize and articulate their agendas in the public space have power to influence how people think. You cannot be ignored or not seen for that matter, when you're able to articulate your lived experience within this democracy. So literacy is a way of convening and conveying meaning for so many people. When folks talk about digital literacy, they're talking about understanding meaning and context. They're talking about knowing what some claims are legitimate and which ones are not. These are basic tools for navigating life in our media-saturated world these days. So literacy, in my mind, is not just something that benefits individuals, it's something that benefits the entire community. I frequently talk about education being both a private and a public good. The distinction here is that it empowers individuals to improve their lives, but it is also a public good to be well-educated and to live in a well-educated community means that it is typically a safer community, it is more productive, you have better health outcomes, all the things the literature tells us. In fact, I met with a donor one time who uh, wanted to have a scholarship that he was naming here at the college to only be available for U.S. citizens. And I, I was struck by that, and, and, I, and I honored that, certainly. And I said, but let me ask you this. So why did you choose to live in Montgomery County? And he kind of paused and he said, well, you know, I, I have this quality of life and my children had this. And he kind of rattled off all the value statements that any of us would think about when we think about Montgomery County. So I said to him, on a most basic and selfish level, if you don't want to buy into a social justice mission that we might have as a community college to educate anyone who wants to come to us, regardless of their citizen status, citizenship status, would you not want to live in a community where people are well educated? Would you not want to live in a community where there's less crime, less dependence on public support, greater voter engagement, better health outcomes, all the things we know about living in an educated community? 
His response, he just paused. He said, you make a valid point, Dr. Paul. I said, just stick with it. Just hold that thought. I said, because at the most basic level, if you don't, if you want to reject the premise that education is just a, is a personal value, it is, but you also have to think about what it means to live in a community when people are well educated, because that is less of a burden on you. That resonated with him. He has not yet changed his, his scholarship. <laughs> I am giving him time. I learned a long time ago in teaching women's studies, everybody's not gonna be a feminist when they walk out the door. <laughs> but the first time she's told she can't do something because she's a woman, she changes her mind very quickly. <laughs> so there are many people who complain in Montgomery County about the fact that we have too many social service agencies, too many nonprofits serving too many people who are at risk. And I often say, just as I say to them now, what type of community do you want to live in? One where folks are hungry or excluded or undereducated, because that impacts everyone. We're not just talking about what it does in terms of agency for an individual, we're talking about what it does for a community. And I'll give you another example of that. I have been very outspoken in our community about our DACA students because these students and these children are already young people, I should say, in our communities. They have been here, they will continue to be here, and as a result of that, we all benefit when they are educated as a community. I see that there's a mutuality to the existence of us being in these things together. One of the things that I appreciate about McHale teachers, I believe, is that you all get the big picture. You understand how all of these factors fit together. You understand that many of your students have more needs than just language skills. Kathy and I were talking earlier about the students who are preparing for citizenship tests and some of the challenges that go with that and all the dynamics that none of us have control over. I understand that many of you serve an informal social work function on the side for many of your students, helping to connect them. Somebody want to tell them that, they, that somebody talking? <laughs> Thank you. I know they're having a good time. We just want to encourage them to have a good time in the hallway. All right. Uh, at Montgomery College, we like to see ourselves in that same position as well. Uh, we provide food banks on each of our campuses for our students and employees who may be needing assistance in this space. We have a clothing library at our Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus because we know how you present yourself when you walk into a space and are looking for a job is very important. We have an emergency fund that helps students who have uh, disruptive events that happen in their life. I had a student the other day Day, uh, whose hearing aid broke. Now, I don't know about you all, I didn't know how much a hearing aid cost. I have not had to purchase one. But to understand what that could be like if you were living in poverty and you need to replace a hearing aid, uh, that was something that was very significant for that family. And our emergency fund and our foundation was able to help utilities, moving expenses from time to time when emergencies occur. We understand that students can't learn if they're hungry. Just like you, we understand that sometimes students need help. And a part of our job, just as you, is to stay connected to the resources that we may be able to advance them and help them find their agency in our community and find the resources they need. That's the kind of radical inclusion that I suspect happens in your classrooms each and every session. I can't imagine that you're just focusing on nouns, verbs, sentence structure, and all the great things that happen with language acquisition. Language operates in context, and families have realities in which they have to operate. So for me, at the most basic level, at the most sincere part of all this conversation, literacy is about survival. That is what we do in our Montgomery College Refugee Center, where people are rebuilding their lives after leaving their home communities. We teach English and cultural skills for recent arrivals. But eventually, literacy is more than just surviving. It becomes about opportunity. Building an effective workforce, as Mikhail says in his mission statement, is central to your work and that of Montgomery Colleges. We try to 
move non-native speakers of English into workforce as quickly as possible. I'll give you an example of one of our initiatives in this space. We offer core classes in English as a second language for healthcare jobs and for the building trades. So we put English language instructors into classes that are teaching very specific vocational skills. We have a certified apartment maintenance technician track and we have a geriatric nursing assistant track. So there are two instructors co-teaching a class, one for content and one for English language and basic skills. Now I want to brag a bit because I know Mikhail, I'm always hearing Kathy talk about numbers because those of you who operate in a grants world, you understand you have to be able to talk about the outcomes that come from that. Because at Montgomery College, it's in our mission statement that we hold ourselves accountable. So the students who are in the first four cohorts of the Certified Apartment Maintenance Technician Program 94% completed and earned a credential, and 72% went on to employment. I think that's something to brag about. Here's one better. Of the students who enrolled in the first three geriatric nursing assistant cohorts, 90% of them have completed and earned a credential, and 81% are now employed. These are fantastic steps. In fact, this is another similarity to the McHale mission. At Montgomery College, we think that education is indeed a two-generation solution to poverty. Literacy classes are inherently two-generation in their impact because if a parent is learning how to read and write and to function in a language other than the one that they normally speak, here's an opportunity for them to have a tremendously positive impact on the children in their home. And dare I say it could be three generations because there are oftentimes grandparents and others living in a home as well. So educating parents to help their children serves both generations. It even works the other way around because we see that oftentimes children become those who help their parents navigate and learn English. I hear that happens all the time from the families that we talk about. I talked to some people in our English, the college's English as a Second Language program last week, and they mentioned to me three patterns that they're seeing in their students. A student who has just graduated from high school and enrolls in the college and then likes it so much that they bring their parents in for more ESL training. The parents see the examples of their kids and how much they're benefiting from English, or some recent arrivals who arrive, enroll their kids in grade school in the U.S., they realize that they can't help their children with their homework, so they come to the college, they come to McHale, they come to your classrooms because they want to help their children. We also get older parents who have been working 12-hour days for a decade in this country while their children were in school, often hot time having a minimal amount of English. Then when their children go to college, we often see the parents enrolling in English classes because now they have more time to do so. English literacy is a tool that benefits multiple generations in a family. And you have likely seen this in your classes each and every day. I see this as two generation solutions to poverty, and I think it's some of the most powerful work that's being done in our country. The primary benefit is opportunity for advancement or to a new career entirely. And I like to think that we who do this work are really actualizing a part of the American dream, giving everyone the opportunity to realize their potential. As I said before, I believe deeply that empowering people in their own lives is tremendously valuable, not only for them personally, but also for the communities that we live in. It promotes upward mobility, financial stability, and it builds public capacity. It helps build thriving communities that Mikhail talks about in his mission. One final element that I want to mention before I take my seat is the one of equity. Montgomery County is a home of over one million residents and about 13% have limited English proficiency. 
that is a lot of people who need a help. And those are just self-reports based on census data. I suspect if we were actually to unpack that, we'd see a lot more. People who can contribute more to their own lives and to the lives of their community, if they get the education they need, should be a powerful reason why we choose to do this work. And I know that the instructors in this room already know this. That's why you choose to do this each and every day. We've talked a lot for years and decades, remember the 80s when it started about diversity. Diversity, 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 right? I'm done with talking about diversity. Uh, diversity is there. I'm about talking about equity and inclusion now. Uh, diversity is simply counting who's in the room. Equity and inclusion is talking about how they experience the room, what outcomes they draw from the room, and more importantly, what are the power dynamics that are a part of their being in that room. So questions of equity and inclusion, and particularly in a county like Montgomery, where the majority is the minority in this county. We have to have very deliberate conversations about the power structures that make decisions for those who do not have the power. This is something that we're doing significantly at Montgomery College, disaggregating data, looking at outcomes across race and gender, and challenging ourselves, and dare I say, as Monica, well, no, making ourselves uncomfortable about this. Right? It's easy to say we're doing this work because look at the, hey, 72% of the students at Montgomery College are non-white. I can tell you, I can tell you we have 160 countries represented in our student body. But I want to have a conversation about access in entering the institution and access in completion. I want to see who walks across the stage on commencement. I want to see whose voices and experiences are not there. And those are the conversations that we have to have around equity. Who is not yet in your classrooms who needs to be there? How are we as a county working deliberately and dare I say through collective impact to bring them into those spaces? Are we challenging the notion that someday that well, just they're not ready yet for these classes? Really? Hmm, not at all. I think at the end of the day we have to challenge ourselves about how we continue to turn ourselves inside out. So Montgomery College has been doing this a lot with our work in community engagement. A few years ago I happened to be at the board of Impact Silver Spring with Kathy. I don't know if you remember this experience. And we had a gentleman who was a network purse a member come in and talk about the services and the support that he had received from Impact Silver Spring. And he was glowing just talking about how powerful African immigrant, late 40s, early 50s probably. And he said to me, uh, and now I'm taking uh, these technician classes through a correspondence program. So he didn't know who I am and he just, I'm sitting there and I kind of think, I said, well, hey, why are you taking a correspondence class? Because in my mind, two things come to mind. I think one, is it accredited? So therefore, will he have a credential that's portable? And perhaps there might be some financial aid that would be available to him if he were coming to an accredited institution. So I said, hey, why didn't you go to Montgomery College? Take that class there, because I knew we had it. He said, oh, Montgomery College, it just seems so far away. And I kind of paused, and I thought, and I, I knew he lived two miles, because he told us about the apartment. You live two miles from the college. I can walk two miles. Two miles to come to college. And I said, but I said, really? I said, the college, but it's so close to you. Our Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus is right there. He said, no, 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 no. And I could literally see him translating. He said, he said, no, it just seems so far away. Uh, see, all my English people, y'all got that, right? <laughs> so here's a college that was designed to meet him where he is, to have an open access mission, to deliver support services and excellent instruction, to have faculty who are deeply engaged in his experience. But his idea is that we, as a college, seemed so far away. So I said, well, how can we get closer to you? And he said, you know, if the college had just a little office, 
that I could go to that was in my community. Hmm, y'all with me on that? It's in my community, maybe even in my building, right? I think he knew he was pushing it by then. But then he said, he said, then, then I could go there and become more comfortable. And I said, then we could hold your hand and take you to the campus. And he said, yes. Right? So the beautiful part about that, so we use that then to become our mission around our community engagement centers. Because what we realized for 70 years, Montgomery College had been uniquely positioned to have hundreds of thousands of people come to our college. But the people who needed us most came with a legacy and a background and a history that we still seem so far away and they couldn't come to us. So we decided to partner with trusted groups in the community who could give us entree into the community and say, we want to be here for you. We know you need us, but more importantly, we need you to survive. Let us be a part of your lived experience. To date, we have served over 30,000 people in our community engagement centers, taking free coursework, coming to talk about the pathway, decoding what it means to be in higher education in this country. There's a whole lot of work that goes into that space. I happen to think and know for a fact that this is an act of radical inclusion. This is an act of breaking down the power structures that at some point, and every time someone says to me, why are you all doing this in the community engagement center? You could be doing this. I always hear him in the back of my mind. It just seems so far away. So for us, I think something is happening. We're looking at collaboration differently at our college, and this opportunity to have you here speaks to what that collaboration is about. I think that teachers of English as a second language are the 21st century heroes of literacy. You all are doing incredible work. And that doesn't even seem, I, I, I said that, I looked at my thesaurus, I need to come up with a better word. You know, 26 letters, 44 sounds in the English language. And you keep thinking there's got to be, there's a word, and I'm amazed. I sit, I'm one of those people that sit and looks at dictionaries, just trying to find the right word. But you all are doing work that is equalizing what's happening in this country right now. I can't think of another group that is dedicated to inclusion more than you are, who appreciates how transformative learning could be, how empowering, that its agency is critical, not only to the communities that we are a part of, but to each and every individual that is in the classroom each and every day with you. We know that literacy, it enables dignity. I think there are a lot of people who've forgotten that. Dignity, it creates pathways to opportunity. So if you don't think that you are radical, Darian Pollard is here today to tell you that you are indeed radical warriors. And I hope, and I'm putting you on notice that our country needs you now more than ever. Your students need you now more than ever. This community needs you more now than ever because literacy, it is radical, it's political, and it is profoundly inclusive when done the way that Mikhail has chosen to do this work. All of our communities need more of this. And I want to thank you for being on the front lines of doing this work and dedicating yourself to continuing to grow as teachers in this space. Many languages, teacher is a very honored term. Somehow or another, I think in this country, we've forgotten that from time to time. But the work that you're doing is so critical to creating environments where radical inclusivity is not just something we talk about, it's something that we choose to live. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here and for your attention today.